Welcome back. I hope you've had a chance to think about this example. Well, remember what we're trying to do is given a linear transformation with its standard basis and some information about where the standard basis goes, we should be able to find, according to this fact, a formula for any vector in R2. Now I'm not sure how far you get got, but the key uh, thing that you need in order to do this problem is one observation. You need to know that any vector x1 and x2 can be written in terms of the standard basis. In fact, what you have is x1, x2 is equal to x1 times the first standard basis element plus x2 times the second basis element. So notice that we've written this as a scalar and we've written this as a scalar multiple of standard basis elements and they're adding their particular sum. So how does this help us? So how does this help us in order to figure out our formula? Well, let's say that you're interested in knowing what Tx1, x2 is. Well, by the observation, this is the same thing as knowing what the function, the linear transformation does to this vector. Okay, we've, in some sense, we've kind of blown this vector apart. Now we've blown it apart, but now we can hit it with properties of a linear transformation, right? Because we're doing a sum of two vectors, right? So this is equal to t x1 times 1, 0 plus t x2 times the vector 0, 1. So by the properties of linear transformations. And then, again, we're going to use another property of linear transformations because the x1 and x2 are scalars, right? So this is equal to x1 t times where it sends the first vector plus x2 times where it sends the second vector. Okay, so this is, again, by the properties of a linear transformation. We don't want that triangle there. There we go. A little bit messy. Let's see if I have any more room on this page. Yeah, uh, uh, no, not really. So now what we know is we actually know what this expression is right here because the person who gave us this problem told us that's what that's equal to. Okay, so let's put it all over here. And what we end up with is the following. We end up with x1 times the vector one, two, three, four, plus x2 times the vector one, one, zero, zero. Okay, so that gives us the answer. And in fact, we could actually go a little bit further. Maybe you want a nice formula. And we could rewrite this as x1 plus x2, 2x1 plus x2, 3x1 plus zero, and 4x1 plus zero. And now you're getting good, better at these sorts of problems. If you stare at this for a second, you notice that you could actually rewrite this in a matrix form, All right? We could write it as 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 0, 4, 0, times the vector x1, x2, okay? And notice that when at the end here, what did we get? We got a matrix transformation. And not only that, there's actually some more information here is look at what we have in this column. This is the output of where the first standard basis vector got went. And this guy here is the output of the second standard basis vector. Okay. So just kind of a a recap here, just quickly, just kind of summarize some of what's happening in this example. We have a linear transformation. We know where it's sending the standard basis element. And we can now use this observation to, to come up with a formula saying that for any x1 and x2, I want to send it to this vector right here. Okay? So using those pieces of information, I can figure out where any vector goes to. And then I have this observation that 
hey, what I've really done is I've taken my linear transformation and wrote it in terms of a matrix multiplication, matrix transformation. Okay. And so that's what the next theorem is actually saying. That if you have a function from Rn to Rm, that's a linear transformation, then there exists a unique matrix A that you can rewrite your linear transformation as a matrix transformation. Okay, so just let me write this out. So IE, every linear transformation is a matrix transformation. And in some sense, this theorem here uh, fills in a gap from our last lecture because we showed that every matrix is a linear transformation, and this now shows the reverse direction, that every linear transformation is a matrix transformation. Now, the proof of the theorem basically follows kind of exactly what we did in the example, but it's done a little bit more abstractly. But one of the things that we can use from this example is we actually can find this matrix A. We can see how this is done. The matrix A that we needed, well, its first column was given by the output of where the first standard basis vector is. And the second column is given by the output of where the second standard basis element gets. So this is actually the procedure to find the matrix A in this theorem. So our proce procedure to find A is you're given a linear transformation and you compute the linear transformation for each of the n standard basis vectors. We're assuming that your domain is Rn and you lick the, given those outputs, those become your columns of the, of the matrix A. And now this matrix A has a special name. So A is called the standard matrix Uh, for the linear transformation T. Okay, so let's say underline standard matrix here because that's the new word. So the A in this theorem, it exists and it's called the standard matrix for the linear transformation. So going back up here, this matrix here is going to be the standard matrix for this linear transformation. So that's the uh, key things that we wanted to get apart, apart, uh, get across in the first part of this first and second part of this lecture. And the next part, we want to talk a little bit about kind of some of the geometry. If we're looking at the case where the domain and the codomain are small enough that we can visualize them. So we'll see that in the next part of the lecture.